Hi! In the past I've used a couple of different cameras where I had to use DC couplers. So I used cheap adapters like this one and used my own power supply so I could control the power and have a more reliable system. This was used on a Canon camera. I didn't buy the manufacturer recommended adapter because they are too expensive. And bear in mind that this adapter doesn't even include DC coupler itself, you have to buy that separately. Now, I'm not questioning the quality of those power supplies, but charging more than 100 euros for a generic 8V 20W adapter is just being greedy. My current camera is a Panasonic GX80, and as you can see the prices are similar to Canon. The alternative is to buy cheap Chinese adapters, but I find it hard to trust the life of my only camera to such a shady power supply, so I ended up, again, going for the path of a custom power supply paired with a cheap battery dummy. But this time, I thought, if I'm about to spend time in a custom power supply, why not just make a custom battery dummy as well? You know, how hard can it be? Looking at this battery, you can see it has metal tabs, which are conveniently labeled. We have the positive and the negative terminals, which are evident with the plus and minus sign, and two signals labeled D and T. I'm assuming T stands for temperature or thermistor, and D stands for data. If you look at my other videos, I had a problem with the Canon 750D that displayed error messages when you connected a power supply other than an original Canon battery, so I'm going to see what happens with the Panasonic. First, let's pretend this is a third-party battery, without an ID chip. I'm going to tape the data pad and see what happens. The camera works fine, but as you can see, the battery gauge stops working properly, which goes in line with how this Duracell branded battery behaves. It displays full capacity for a long time, and then, suddenly, it flashes red, warning about the imminent shutdown. This battery has a half charge, and is displaying a full charge, but if I enable the data line again, you can see it displays the correct capacity again. Now, I'm going to see what happens when I disable the temperature signal. Again, I'm going to type the corresponding pad in the battery. As you can see, the camera refuses to work without this signal. The nominal resistance is 10 kilo ohms. It is getting warmer because it is in my hand. And the resistance is getting lower as it gets hotter, so this should be a negative temperature coefficient thermistor or NTC thermistor. With these two tests, we now have two important pieces of information. We know that we only need data line to get accurate battery measurements, and the camera doesn't work without the thermistor. This means we don't need to do anything else to make our DC coupler, because we don't need battery measurements, because it's connected to a DC adapter, and we can use a regular 10K resistor instead of the thermistor. The camera will think it has a third-party battery that currently sits at the current ambient temperature. The next step is to make the dummy battery, to fit inside the camera. I didn't find the proper battery measurements online, so I've just used a ruler and I've made this. There is a hole in the bottom to connect the power cable. It is not centered, because this spot is where the hole in my camera's battery cover is, as you will see later. On top we have the same four holes as in the battery. These are two parts that fit in each other after assembly. I also made a small box to house the power supply. It has two slots, one for the unregulated DC input and the other to output the correct voltage for the camera. I am going to use a 3D printer to make these parts. All the files for this project will be available for download, links in the description. If you don't have access to a 3D printer or you don't want to, you can just buy a Chinese adapter and use your custom power supply with it. Now that we have our 3D printed dummy battery, you have several choices for the metal contacts. You can just cut three strips of metal and glue them in place. You can use copper clad board and carve the required connectors by hand. Or you can do what I did and go for the longer but more precise route, which is to make a small PCB with the pads in the right place. This is the PCB I've made on Eagle. It's just four pads with the correct spacing between them and three holes for the wires that come from behind. This is a small simple board, and I will only need one copy, so to save money, I will do it here instead of sending it to a PCB house. I've used a laser printer to print a circuit on a transparency. Then I use that transparency to expose a pre-sensitized copper board. 
Then I etched it in iron chloride. Finally, I've cleaned the resulting board with acetone and drilled the holes for the wires. After grinding the PCB so it fits nicely in place, now I'm going to coat the copper board with tin to avoid corrosion. Now I'll solder the 10K resistor in place. It is connected between the negative terminal and the T terminal. This resistor will trick the camera into thinking this is a battery with a temperature probe. Now I will solder the power wires in place. Finally, I'll grind the excess solder so the PCB can fit closer to the holes. To hold the PCB in place temporarily, I'll use a bit of hot glue. To make it definitive, I'll use epoxy. I'll just fill it with a layer of epoxy and, after curing, this is not coming apart again. Now the power connector. I'll use 2.5mm for connection jacks because they are thin enough to fit through my camera hole in the battery compartment. This is a tip. This is the first ring. This is the second ring, and this is the sleeve. The sleeve on the ring 2 will carry the negative of the power supply, and the tip on the ring 1 will carry the positive. To reduce the chance of breaking stuff in case of distractions, I'm soldering a diode in parallel with the power wires. Hopefully it will protect the camera if someone sticks a plug with the incorrect pin out. Next, I'll solder the power wires.
Finally, before gluing, I'm gonna cover the holes in the jack so that the glue won't get inside. I'll mix another batch of epoxy. I inserted the male plug in the female jack to hold it in place. Now I just pour the epoxy inside. It looks like a thin layer, but the epoxy is very strong, and when you have a large amount of fast curing epoxy, it might get too hot and warp the surrounding plastic, as curing epoxy is an exothermal reaction. If you want epoxy to cure faster, you can add a source of heat, like this small LED lamp. This is the complete adapter. I was going to glue it together, but I ended up leaving it held together with tape. This way, I can easily open it if there is a need to fix anything inside. Now that we have our adapter, let's go over to the power supply. My objective is to do this project with parts I have laying around. I wanted a power supply, capable of operating with a large range of input voltages, without the need for a neat sink. So, that means using a DC to DC switching converter. I have lots of them around, so I'll use the L5973D controller from ST. The internal MOSFET on controllers like this can fail as a short. To protect against this failure and to have a cleaner output, I will add an additional linear regulator to the output of the switching converter. I have the perfect candidate here, the MIC29302 from Microchip. It can handle up to 3 amps and has a very low dropout. At 1.5 amps, it has a typical dropout of 250 millivolts. That means I can set it to output just below the voltage of the switching converter. I have the first regulator set to 8.4 volts and the linear regulator set to 7.9 volts, so we are not losing a large amount of energy and I won't need an additional heatsink. Once again, I only need one of these PCBs. So I just made another one using the same method as before. This is the printed box and the assembled power supply PCB. Now I'm going to make the cable to connect the power supply to the camera.
Now, finally, I solder the input for the power supply and we're done. As expected, it outputs 7.9 volts. And, if everything works as expected, the supply should limit the current to just above 2 amps. This is the finished supply. I use a rubber band to attach it to whatever I find convenient, in this case, the camera tripod. Now, this DC coupler is used just like any other. The adapter is inserted in the battery compartment. The camera has a small rubber cover that I lift to insert the power cable and it just works.